Hello and welcome to HR Talk, where today we're talking about case law on age discrimination. I'm joined today by Richard Fox, a partner and head of employment law at Solicitors Kingsley Napley. Two cases were heard together recently before the Supreme Court. One was called Selden versus Clarkson, Wright and Jakes. The other was called Homer versus Chief Constable of Yorkshire Police. The first dealt with compulsory retirement. The second with whether a particular employment provision was discriminatory on the grounds of age. Richard, can you briefly explain the outcome in the Selden case, please? Yes, the Selden case was all about justifying discriminatory treatment. Listy Selden was a solicitor who was coming up to the age of 65 in his firm of Clarkson, Wright and Jakes. At 65, he was being forcibly asked to retire. He needed an extra three years financially before he could retire, and he wanted to stay on. The firm wouldn't let him, so he had to contest the case before the Employment Tribunal, where he lost, before the EAT, where he lost, before the Court of Appeal, where he lost, and he went to the Supreme Court, and he lost again on that. In other words, it was justifiable for the firm to impose a compulsory retirement age. The issue that was left undecided was whether the age could be 65 or some other age, and that is the question that will go back to the Employment Tribunal to be determined in a few months' time. So, is this good news or bad news for employers? I think it's good news for employers. It doesn't give them the certainty that they had under the default retirement age. That is true. But it has confirmed it is possible to have a retirement age and to justify it. So, how is it possible to justify a retirement age? Well, this is actually an extremely interesting question because when the Selden case started to go through the courts, it was felt that you could justify direct and indirect discrimination on the same basis. We now know, following cases through the European courts, that you justify direct discrimination differently to indirect discrimination, and to justify direct discrimination, you have to use public interest defences, intergenerational fairness, dignity, etc. And what did the court decide in the Homer case? Well, the Homer case, interestingly, was an indirect discrimination case. Uh, Mr Homer had been a detective inspector at West Yorkshire Police, and he joined the database as soon as he retired. He had specialist legal knowledge through his many years as a police officer, uh, and he didn't need a law degree at that time. However, the database was having difficulty recruiting, and they decided they needed to import a measure of career progression. They set three thresholds. The top one, the third threshold, required a law degree. Mr Homer passed through thresholds one and two, but failed at three. And he said, in order to acquire a law degree, I need to engage in a part-time course. It will take me four years, by which time I'll have retired. So he complained. He complained internally, once and lost, twice and lost, then lodged a grievance and lost, and went to the Employment Tribunal and won on the basis that it was indirectly discriminatory to ask him to have a law degree. Unfortunately, he then lost before the EAT and he lost before the Court of Appeal on the basis that it wasn't age that was causing the problem, but his impending retirement. And it then wound up before the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court was not impressed of the ingenuity of the arguments of the respondents in the two courts below and decided it was indirectly discriminatory to ask him to have a law degree in order to reach the third threshold. The case has gone back again to the Employment Tribunal to determine how it could be justified in this particular case by the employer imposing that limit and again we'll have to wait a few months to reach final resolution in that case if it's not sorted out beforehand. So what golden rules for avoiding age discrimination claims can we glean from these two cases? I think the first and crucial golden rule is that if you can manage without a retirement age, do so. There'll be no problems if you can manage like that. That is the first preference. But for some businesses, that's not acceptable. For some businesses, they still do want to have a retirement age. If you're one of those businesses, you need to give very careful thought to how you're going to justify that. 
If it's a question of direct discrimination, as almost certainly it will be, you have to use the public interest grounds we now know in order to justify. But it's not going to be enough just to use the blueprint set in the Selden case. You have to bring it on board into your business and decide whether or not those grounds apply to you. So, for example, dignity. It may be that you've got lots of performance management procedures in your business, in which case the dignity legitimate ground may not apply. You should also document your decision. It's not critical, but it's helpful. And the reason it's not critical is because the court ultimately will decide the case on the basis of what happened when the discrimination was applied, when the discriminatory treatment took place. And it may be helpful to look at what the parties were thinking about at the relevant time, but it won't be critical. The last golden rule has to be which age to choose. And that is really difficult at the moment to determine. We don't have the magic 65 that we had when the DRA applied. We're all going to look to Selden in a few months' time to see if 65 will be an age that was justified. My own guess is that it will be, but you can't give with one hand and snatch back with the other. It would almost be unworkable if you couldn't fasten upon a particular age, but we have to wait and see. If Selden does determine 65 was an appropriate age, I suspect a lot of businesses will be fastening upon 65 as well. Richard, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. I much enjoyed it. And if you want to find out more about the issues we've been discussing, go to our website at www.peoplemanagement.co.uk.